Greetings from the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's author talk with Ben Sheehan on his book, OMG, WTF Does the Constitution Actually Say? A Non-Boring Guide to How Our Democracy is Supposed to Work. Today we celebrate Constitution Day, the day when the delegates to the Constitutional Convention in 1787 signed the new charter for a federal government. The National Archives has a long tradition of marking this anniversary. Even though we can't be together this Constitution Day, we can focus on the future. In 2026, six short years from now, we will be celebrating America's 250th, 250 years since our founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776, jeopardizing their lives, committing treason, and risking everything for American independence. Without the Declaration, we would not have the U.S. Constitution. This year's Constitution Day may not look like our usual celebration, but we can look forward to marking the 250th anniversary of the United States as a healthier, stronger, and more perfect union. Joining us today for a plain language explanation of what's in the United States Constitution is Ben Sheehan, a former award-winning executive producer at Funny or Die, Sheehan has been on a mission to increase voter participation since 2016. In 2018, he founded OMG WTF, standing for Ohio, Michigan, Georgia, Wisconsin, Texas, Florida, to teach voters about executive races during the midterm elections. That project generated his book, OMG WTF Does the Constitution Actually Say? An Essential Primer on How Our Government Was Designed to Work Originally from Washington, D.C., Sheehan has a B.A. in American Studies and Political Science from Emory University and an M.A. from New York University in Music Business. In 2018, he was named one of the entertainment industry's next-gen 35 rising executives under 35 by The Hollywood Reporter. Now I'll turn you over to Ben Sheehan. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, David, for that kind introduction. It helps to start because today is Constitution Day. So September 17th, why is this Constitution Day? Well, 233 years ago today, the Constitution was signed. And I wanna give a little bit of a backdrop to what led up to this meeting, uh, the signing of the Constitution and, and how we got this document. So between May 25th, 1787 and September 17th, 1787, you had 55 people in a tiny room in Philadelphia in Independence Hall. It's extremely hot. There's no AC. Uh, they're heavily dressed. And for less than four months, they're debating about what our government is going to look like. And the previous constitution, the Articles of Confederation, were sort of a loose agreement between the 13 existing states. And what happened is that in Massachusetts, there was a uprising. Uh, um, a courthouse was, was taken over. Um, there was a rebellion earlier in 1787. It was a class rebellion. I think it's important to be honest about what actually led to the Constitution. It was a class uprising, a rebellion, anger over taxes. And those working people ended up winning a lot of state legislative seats in Massachusetts. And so a bunch of sort of the ruling elites, so to speak, were scared of this, and so they wanted to figure out a way to have a central government that protected the states in case of domestic uprising and, and other security threats. So they met for almost four months, and what's interesting is that 39 people signed the Constitution, seven of those were immigrants. I wanna go through and talk about a few things that are in the Constitution that are particularly relevant to where we are today. And I'd like to start with the census. So in the first article, we are constitutionally mandated every 10 years to count the population. And we use that count for two things. One of which is to decide how much states are gonna pay in taxes. Back in 1787 uh, and, and after that, it was states paying taxes per head. So each person paid an even amount of tax. So it was to decide the population to decide how much states were going to pay in, in tax. And the other thing in the Constitution is apportionment for the House of Representatives. So the idea is we count the population every 10 years. You know, every 10 years, some people are going to move outside of the state, move into the state, move around the state. 
So getting a fair population count decides how many people are in the House of Representatives. So every 10 years we count it and then we reapportion the House. So some states may gain representatives in, in the House and some states might lose representatives. And we added representatives over the years as the population grew, but in 1929, uh, Congress capped it at 435. So that's where we are today, which is kind of wild because when the Constitution was written, it was 30,000 30, people uh, per representative. Today, it's almost 800,000 per representative, which is many more times uh, the population basis than the founders thought uh, was going to be. It's also important to talk about who was counted in the Constitution during apportionment. So this is something that is a, a, a shameful part of, of, of what I believe to be an incredible document. But the founders decided a compromise. And you've probably heard of this comp compromise, the three-fifths compromise. And the idea was that southern states had high populations of enslaved people. And were those people going to get counted for the purpose of taxes and apportionment in the House? If they were, then southern states would end up paying a lot more in taxes, but they'd also have a lot more power in the House because those people could not vote. So were a small number of eligible voters going to have an outsized amount of power and representation in the House of Representatives? So they took this old idea uh, from the Articles of Confederation that wasn't actually part of it, but was pitched for it, called the Three-Fifths Compromise. And how everyone was counted is as follows. It was free people were counted as one, People who were serving for a fixed term of labor, that person was counted as one. Native Americans that weren't taxed were counted as zero, and all other persons were three-fifths, so 60% of a person. This would later be changed by the 14th Amendment, but I think it's important to understand who the Constitution was counting originally uh, when determining how many representatives were in the House. I think one of the most misunderstood things about the Constitution is voting. I'll start by saying Election Day. Election Day isn't specifically in the Constitution, but Congress has the ability to make or alter the times, places, and manner of elections for representatives and senators. So when has Congress exercised that authority? Well, one way is by establishing Election Day. And I want to give a brief story about how Election Day came to be, because it's very strange. In 1845, Congress passed this law establishing that Election Day was going to be the Tuesday after the first Monday in November. Now, why did they pick this day? Well, turns out at the time, a lot of people in the country were farmers, and they had a schedule. They had to plant in March, and they harvested in October, and it was a lot of work. And at the time, sometimes they had to travel a long way to get to a polling place, Sometimes as many as two days, and obviously there are no cars or lime scooters or whatever. So you had to go by horse and buggy or horseback, and it could take up to 48 hours. Congress decided to not interfere with the harvesting planting schedule, and they decided to set a day where it would be outside that schedule, but also not too cold, so people wouldn't freeze to death as they were traveling. So they picked the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, and they picked a Tuesday because people had church on Sunday, and largely farmers markets were on Wednesday, so that gave them a Monday day to travel. They could vote, you know, maybe in the morning on Tuesday, and then get back for the farmers markets on Wednesdays. And we've kept that law for 175 years, even though the vast majority of the country are no longer farmers. So something to think about that Congress has the power in the Constitution to change by law the day that we all vote on. So they could do that tomorrow or whenever they want, but they haven't done it for 175 years, which is pretty strange. Who votes specifically in the Constitution? So one thing that I think a lot of us don't realize is that we don't fundamentally have the right to vote in the Constitution. In the first article, U.S. representatives in the House were elected by the residents of each of each state and if you were allowed to vote in your state's elections for the state house you could then vote in its elections for the u.s house but who were the people that were allowed to vote in state house elections well it was up 
to the state. The states determined who was eligible to vote. And in many states, they mandated that only white male property owners could vote. Um, in some states, actually free African Americans were able to vote as early as the 1790s. And my home state of Maryland was one of those six states. So we often think about the 15th Amendment in 1870 as granting African Americans and former slaves the right to vote, but it actually does something a little bit different, and I'll get to that uh, in a moment. What about senators? Well, at the time, senators were actually elected by state legislators, which means that people like us didn't vote directly for our senators. In fact, it wasn't until the 17th Amendment in 1913 that people directly elected senators, and for the same reason as the House. If you could vote in your state's House elections after 1913, you could then vote in your state's elections for senators. Another thing that we talk about is the right to vote for president. Uh, we hear a lot about it right now because we're in the middle of a presidential election, but it turns out that we don't in the Constitution fundamentally have the right to vote for president. The Electoral College, the structure where we determine electors who then directly vote for the president and the vice president, um, has only been determined by statewide popular votes in every state since 1880. So for the first almost 100 years of the country, states could, their legislatures could just pick the electors themselves. Uh, and only since 1880 has every state allowed a popular vote for president to determine the electors. So we'll talk about the expansion of democracy and, and the power of our vote, because if you think of the three branches of the federal government, there's no direct elections for, for the federal court system. Uh, for president, yeah, we have a, a, a popular vote, and now every state uses that to determine electors, but it's not granted to us in the Constitution that we have the right to vote directly for president, and we only used to vote for members of the House. Which brings me to the voting rights amendments. The 15th Amendment the 19th Amendment, the 24th Amendment, and the 26th Amendment. So again, in the Constitution, we don't fundamentally have the right to vote, but there are four amendments that protect our right to vote from being taken away based on certain things. So the first one is the 15th Amendment uh, for race, color, or previous condition of servitude. If you are a U.S. citizen as of 1870, you can't have your right to vote if you have it taken away because of your race. In 1920, the 19th Amendment did the same thing but for sex. So women, if they were allowed to vote, could have their voting rights protected and they couldn't have them taken away based on their sex. For the 24th Amendment, it was your ability to pay a tax, specifically a poll tax and, or any other tax. And then the 26th is if you're 18 and over. But Again, because states largely determined who could vote, these are these strange sort of after the fact um, protections on voting rights being taken away but not fundamentally granting people the right to vote. So it just goes to show you how much power states have in determining who can vote and that the ability of people to vote in elections is largely determined at the state level, although Congress can make or alter those times, places, and manner. Some of the stranger things I discovered when writing this book um, are things like letters of mark and reprisal. So a letter of mark and reprisal is something that Congress had the power to do. And what it is, is in a new nation, you didn't have a necessarily well-stocked Navy. You're just starting out. You don't have a ton of ships yet. You don't have a ton of people serving in the Navy. So. What they did is private citizens who owned ships could get a letter, a letter of mark and reprisal from the Congress saying that they could use that ship and act as a volunteer member of the Navy and capture or plunder enemy ships. Um, this is something that we don't do anymore, but technically we haven't outlawed it or banned it through treaties. So if Congress wanted to bring this back, they could. Uh, it would be very strange to have a bunch of people going around in jet skis and trying to capture and plunder uh, enemy ships, but it's 2020 for us. Another thing I learned is the fact that we don't have a spe specific number of judges on the Supreme Court mandated by the Constitution. Uh, Congress has the ability to change the number of Supreme Court justices whenever it wants. And since 1869, we've had nine justices on the court, but 
kind of like with election day, if Congress wanted, they could pass a law tomorrow to change that and up it to 15 or 18 or 46, whatever they wanted. But that number of nine justices is not in the Constitution. And there's something else that I found fascinating that is not in the Constitution that is a power that we have given to the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court doesn't actually have the power in the Constitution to strike down laws if they think they are unconstitutional. It's something called judicial review, and I won't get into too many details, but there was a Supreme Court case in 1803 called Marbury versus Madison that was the first example of ju judicial review being used by the Supreme Court. And ever since, we've just assumed that the court's ability to strike down laws if they think they're unconstitutional is part of the Constitution, but it isn't. So we've all just been operating as if this is the power of the court, uh, but it's not actually in our, our Constitution. Also, anybody can be a Supreme Court justice. If you are watching this and you have a pulse, you are qualified to be a justice on the Supreme Court. And that also goes for Speaker of the House and President pro tempore. In fact, you don't even need to be a senator to be the president pro tempore of the Senate, which, by the way, is the sort of substitute president for the vice president. So the vice president, oddly enough, is the only person who's both a member of the federal legislative branch as the president of the Senate and of the executive branch as the vice president. But oftentimes the vice president is off helping the president on something. And so there's a stand in president, the president pro tempore in the Senate. But again, that person doesn't have any specific qualifications or requirements in the Constitution, and neither does the Speaker of the House. That person doesn't even need to be a representative. So if you're watching this and somehow you're able to convince a majority of the Senate to vote for you as Senate President pro tempore or a majority of the House of Representatives to vote for you as the Speaker, Congratulations, you are now uh, both second in line for the presidency if you are the speaker and third in line in pres for the presidency if you are the Senate president pro tempore. Very strange. Now I wanna talk about something that is, as I alluded to earlier with the three-fifths compromise, um, a stain on the constitution and that is slavery. But the strange thing about slavery in the constitution is that it isn't mentioned by name until 1865. However, in the original seven articles, it comes up three times. And once is the three-fifths compromise, uh, which I talked about earlier. The second is the US could not withdraw from the international slave trade until 1808. So under President Thomas Jefferson, the first instance, uh, first possible day that the US could withdraw from the international slave trade was January 1st, 1808. However, this didn't mean that it ended the slave trade because there was still the domestic slave trade that would continue for many decades until 1865. Um, but this was, it created this cushion of 20 years where people could still participate in the international slave trade. And the third thing is the fugitive slave clause. In the fourth article, it says that uh, people who escape from one state and end up in another state, they have to be returned uh, to their, uh, their rightful owners in uh, the state from which they fled, regardless of whether uh, the state they fled to allows slavery. But it wasn't until 1865 that the Constitution specifically mentioned slavery and outlawed it. And that brings me to three very important amendments, uh, which are the Reconstruction Amendments. And the Reconstruction Amendments are 1865, 1868, and 1870. And what they did was in a five-year span, they gave a massive amount uh, of new freedom and rights and protections to, to freed slaves. For the 13th Amendment, it was abolishing slavery. The 14th Amendment, it was uh, citizenship and equal protection of the laws. And the 15th Amendment was the protection on voting rights. But there are some sort of interesting loopholes and, and caveats that I want to discuss. One is that in the 13th Amendment, Slavery is outlawed except as a punishment for a crime. So that's why today and for many decades, you have people who are incarcerated, who are made to work in some states for free as a punishment for a crime. And that carve out is specifically in the 13th Amendment. The 14th Amendment is fascinating because it is five sections. We often focus on the first 
section, which talks about birthright citizenship and uh, equal protection of the laws. But the second section, believe it or not, kind of created voting rights protections for African Americans, freed slaves, before the 15th Amendment. So what it said is that for men, it specified men, the first time in the Constitution that it specified men as being eligible voters, men 21 and over who were residents of their state and U.S. citizens, if they were allowed to vote, specifically that they hadn't committed a crime, which is the loophole, if they were prevented from voting, that state would lose its population basis for the House of Representatives. So for every person who was eligible to vote under the 14th Amendment that wasn't allowed to vote by their state, the state would get dinged, you know, a lower population basis per person. But this didn't really go far enough because states continued to disenfranchise people of color. And so the 15th Amendment in 1870 specifically states race, color, or previous condition of servitude. But what's interesting about the 15th Amendment is that it says your right to vote can't be denied or abridged. So denied, meaning you can't vote. Abridged, meaning your vote is somehow less impactful than other votes. But for many decades after that, states put obstacles in place of people trying to vote. Some of these obstacles are, are, are famous, like poll taxes, which the Constitution abolished in the, with the 24th Amendment. Um, literacy tests. You were made to read part of the Constitution, oddly enough, and if you couldn't read that, you weren't then allowed to vote. Even things that weren't really literacy tests, like counting the bubbles in a bar of soap um, or the jelly beans in a jar, but these were things that were permitted because states argued that they weren't denying their right to vote, they weren't lowering the impact of their vote, but they were obstacles put in place. The or other crime part of the 14th Amendment is interesting because today, felony disenfranchisement, which is the term for not allowing people who either are in prison or have a felony on their record, not allowing those people to vote, that comes down to the state. And it's still largely a state issue. And there are a few states today, like Iowa and Kentucky and Virginia, that in their state constitutions, they ban felons from voting for life, although the governor can reinstate those voting rights. But in Maine and Vermont, even if you're incarcerated, you're still able to vote. So we have a very wide spectrum. Again, states have a ton of power when it comes to determining who in their state can vote. Which brings me to the amendment process itself. So I think about a conversation between Jefferson and Madison because I have these days a little bit of time on my hands. And Jefferson wrote to Madison about the amendments process. Now Jefferson wasn't at the actual convention and I should take a step aside and talk about how impactful James Madison was, I mean, he's on the cover of this book, in writing the Constitution. In fact, he had more to do with the writing of the Constitution than any other single individual. Uh, he's somebody that we often overlook uh, in terms of their contribution to the Constitution. In fact, his original draft of the, the Virginia Plan, which is the first plan presented at the Constitutional Convention, was largely the plan that people went off of. He took insanely detailed notes, kind of like overachiever in the front of the class, writing down everything the teacher said, but that is how we know what happened because he took such incredible notes. In addition to that, James Madison wrote the entire Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, and it was partly because some states were hesitant about ratifying the Constitution. This was a this gave a lot more power than the article, Articles of Confederation had to a central government, and they were afraid that it could become tyrannical. And so, in part to help get those states still a little bit on the fence to ratify the Constitution, Madison went off and wrote 19 amendments. Now, not all of these made it. The House ratified, or House passed 17, and the Senate passed 12, so because both houses of Congress have to pass these amendments by a two-thirds vote, 12 got proposed to the states and 10 of those became the Bill of Rights. And these are the things we think about that are our rights as individuals protecting us from an overreaching or totalitarian or tyrannical government. Things like freedom of speech, things like freedom of religion, freedom to peaceably assemble, freedom to you know, petition the government for a redress of grievances, AKA complain about the government to the government. 
Um, things like uh, your Second Amendment rights, things like uh, you know prevention from uh, unreasonable searches and seizure, um, a right to a lawyer, a right to a jury trial um, in, a, in a criminal case, in a federal case. All these things that are our rights as individuals, the Eighth Amendment, you know, protecting us from being uh, um, penalized with cruel and unusual punishment. These were things that solidified the, the, the protections and the freedoms of the individual to prevent from a totalitarian government. Anyway, so Madison had a lot to do with the Constitution, but he had this conversation by letter with Thomas Jefferson, and what Jefferson said is that he thought the Constitution should be changed every 19 years because it was like expecting a coat that you had as a child to fit you as an adult in the same way that laws and, and, and protections and regulations uh, aren't necessarily applicable to one generation as they will be to future generations. Things change and the Constitution has to adapt with the times. We often think of the Constitution as something that is set in stone and it is the supreme law of the land. There is no law higher in the United States than the Constitution. It, is, it dictates everything that, that we do. It's the ultimate backstop um, on our structure and rules of our government. But that doesn't mean it's not supposed to be changed. And the entirety of Article 5 is about the amendments process. And I want to talk a little bit about the amendments process because it's very strange how we're able to amend the Constitution. And by strange, I mean difficult. Back when there were 13 states, it wasn't impossible, it wasn't crazy to get three quarters of states to ratify an amendment. But today, that's 38 states, getting 38 states to agree on something. But I'll take a step back and just explain the proposal and the ratification process. So there are two ways to amend the Constitution in terms of proposing an amendment. The first is that if two thirds of the House and the Senate send it for consideration to the states. The other way is if two thirds of states, their state legislatures, call for a constitutional convention. Now, of all 27 amendments that exist for the Constitution, we've only used Congress proposing it to the states, which means two thirds of states calling for a convention has never happened in American history. As far as the ratification process, there are two ways to ratify amendments. The first one is if 38 states, their state legislatures, ratify an amendment and then it gets added to the Constitution. The second way is if Congress specifies that conventions in each state ratify an amendment. That's only happened with the 21st Amendment to repeal prohibition. The others have all been state legislatures ratifying amendments. I do want to talk about specifically the 26th and the 27th Amendment because it's really interesting who was behind the ratifications of these amendments. So the push for the 26th Amendment, which grants voting rights protections to people who are 18 and up, versus what happened in the 14th Amendment when it specified 21 and up, that was led by young people. That was led by people who were 18 and over, who were being drafted to go off to war, but they didn't actually have a say in the elected leaders who were sending them off to fight. And so there was a huge protest movement. And it was largely because of these young people that this amendment was proposed and then ratified. And the final amendment I want to talk about is the 27th Amendment. And this is probably my favorite story that I learned about while writing this book. So back in 1982, a student at the University of Texas named Gregory Watson wrote a paper on an amendment he had discovered that hadn't expired and had been ratified by some states. And what the amendment said is that if Congress wanted to give itself a pay increase, as in increase the pay for representatives and senators, it had to do it after an election had intervened. So they can't like pass a law and then make more money tomorrow. An election would have to come in between and then it would go into effect. So he wrote this paper, right? And he submitted it to his TA and he got a C. And he was pissed. So he decided to appeal the grade to his teacher 
and the teacher upheld the C. So now he's really upset because he thinks he did a great job on this paper, and he starts writing and calling state legislatures around the country. And over the next decade, they start to ratify this amendment. And 10 years later, after he got his C, Alabama became the 38th state to ratify this amendment, adding it to the United States Constitution. A few years ago, because <laughs> he hadn't let it go, he repetitioned the University of Texas at Austin to consider a grade change from this decades-old paper that had actually led to a constitutional amendment, and although he asked for an A+, the University of Texas gave him an A. The point of me talking about these two amendments is that the two most recent amendments to the Constitution were largely championed and added because of the efforts of young people, of the efforts of teenagers, of people in their 20s. And it goes to show you that even though it's incredibly difficult and incredibly hard, you do have power. You can make change at the local level, at your state level, at the federal level. You can even start a movement that adds a constitutional amendment. And I think it starts by understanding the power that you have that was given to you by this incredible document 231 years ago. And knowing how the country works so that you can use that knowledge to make the changes you want to see. This country and the government that is set up is supposed to work for us. It's supposed to work for you. And I think it's really inspiring to know that it was younger generations that added the most recent amendments to the Constitution. And in honor of Constitution Day, maybe take a moment and think about what amendment you would like to see to the Constitution. Because again, this document was set up to be changed. So what would you want to see as the 28th Amendment, or the 29th Amendment, or the 30th Amendment? You don't have to write a paper about it, but just think about it, and then get to work. Have a great Constitution Day, and thanks for watching.